So welcome everyone to uh, our webinar today titled Back to Our Roots, a look at what's happening in root research now and into the future. Uh, today's webinar will be uh, talking about our CI 600 in situ root imager and our CI 602 narrow gauge root imager. Uh, today, I will be presenting a little bit of research uh, that's uh, been conducted using the, the CI-600. I'll talk about the instruments a little bit, uh, and then we also have a guest speaker today. Um, so you'll be hearing uh, uh, firsthand from somebody who is a user of our instrument, um, and then we will have a Q&A session with both myself and our guest speaker. Uh, so before we get started, I actually would like to kind of cover some housekeeping and uh, do some introductions. So. Um, first, I want to introduce you to Susie Truitt. She's our uh, uh, webinar moderator for today. Uh, she's our distributor manager here at CID Bioscience. She's been with the company for about eight years, and she'll be the one um, posting uh, relevant links and, and uh, helping to uh, organize and, and, and answer questions um, uh, for you today. So thank you, Susie, for, for being our moderator today. And then a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Galen and I'm an application scientist at CID Bioscience. Uh, I have a bachelor's degree in biochemistry and a master's degree in food science from Michigan State University. I'm an IFT certified food scientist and uh, before uh, working at CID, I was a uh, lab manager for a food testing laboratory and I also worked as a food safety consultant uh, for the food manufacturing, produce and cannabis industries. So today uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the CID or the CI 600 and the CI 602. We'll talk about the features, uh, a little bit about specifications, um, and then we'll go right into uh, a, a few studies of uh, that I that I selected to kind of showcase how the CI 600 and 602 are being utilized, um, and uh, and then we'll go into a, a, a guest presentation from Dr. Lorenzo Rossi from the University of Florida. And uh, he's got a really, really awesome presentation set up for us today. So I'm really excited to hear it. Uh, and then we'll kind of uh, wrap things up and we'll go into a Q&A session uh, where you can ask myself questions, you can ask Dr. Rossi questions um, uh, about his presentation. And uh, and yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully it'll be a very informative uh, webinar for all of us, so. Just to kind of give you guys an overview of who CID Bioscience is, uh, we were founded in 1989, so we have more than 30 years of experience in creating plant uh, research tools. So uh, we, we create these to help serve the research community as well as commercial needs. Um, and what we specialize in and what we focus on is creating non-destructive measurement tools um, that can help researchers acquire consistent and high quality data. Uh, and so our instruments are, are, are known for their ability to, to provide these kind of instant accurate results, uh, their durability, their portability, and also uh, for their data transparency. And, and we're really proud of the fact that all of our product line is engineered here uh, uh, and tested and manufactured. Um, all of that is, is happening all here under the roof at our headquarters in Camas, Washington. Um, and so we're really proud of that. Uh, so let's move on to talk about the CI 600. So if we're talking about uh, the uh, kind of general uh, overview of why this is uh, uh, an important tool to use, um, uh, really all you have to do is, is uh, uh, read any uh, research paper uh, in the root field and you'll see that um, root growth dynamics are, are a really important thing to, to observe and to monitor um, because they can vary uh, and they respond really rapidly and they vary so much uh, between uh, biotic and abiotic stressors. And so being able to actually uh, monitor the roots, uh, you know, uh, over time and, and see what's happening uh, in response to these different stressors um, uh, throughout, you know, throughout an entire growing season uh, is, a, is a key way to improve like crop management practices. And, um, and so this is a non-destructive root imager and it's so it, you, there is no harm done to the plant. You can use it to monitor throughout an entire season. Um, and it'll, uh, it'll provide you a lot of, of really important information. 
uh, uh, so looking at root system architecture, uh, timing of new growth or root dormancy, um, it'll show you root length, depth, uh, you can look at uh, uh, mycorrhizal root tips, fungal infection, parasites, nematode cysts, um, all kinds of disease markers. So it's, it's just a really powerful imaging tool. Um, and the way you do it is you just install these clear plastic tubes throughout your field uh, near your plants. Uh, and then you can use that to, uh, as a housing for the instrument to actually uh, image and track these changes to the root systems. So you can uh, also look at things like responses to fertilizer applications or uh, changes in root structure due to watering schedules and looking at root dieback from disease, like I mentioned. So um, really, really cool tool. And both the 600 and 602 can provide this information. So just kind of getting into the, a little bit of the features and the specifications of them. Uh, so the, the 600 and 602 uh, can provide these very high resolution images up to uh, 23.5 million pixels. Um, and uh, uh, for the 600, uh, the options go from 100 to 300 to 600 DPI. Um, the 602, being the narrow gauge root imager, uh, can go up to 1200 DPI as well for scanning resolution. They do take 360 degree scans. So if you can imagine it uh, 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 working kind of by inserting into the tube and it just rotating in a complete 360 degrees while taking an image, uh, that's how it works. Um, it does give you live updated root images as it scans. Um, and it's all powered by this tablet computer that comes with it uh, that uh, uh, both powers it and it ha uh, houses the software for powering uh, and acquiring images and also analysis software for anal analyzing the images. Um, that analysis, analysis software I'll talk about in the next slide um, but it's uh, uh, all a very portable and convenient design, uh, easy to transport, uh, easy to move from tube to tube uh, by just inserting the scan head into, into, into whatever tube it is that you need to use. Um, and like I mentioned, uh, you can uh, keep these tubes installed for a very long time. Uh, and so that allows you to observe growth uh, over multiple growing seasons. So it's not like you have to continuously remove these tubes or these installation uh, acrylic tubes and put them back in the ground. Uh, for uh, the most part, you can leave them in for, for very long periods of time. Uh, in fact, we do have researchers that have been using uh, uh, tubes in uh, the tundra in Greenland uh, for quite some time. Uh, I think uh, some of the tubes have been installed for around eight, eight years or something like that. So they do, they do last quite a long time. They are a pretty robust uh, uh, tube. And so the di main difference that we, probably the most common question we get asked, and uh, uh, that is what is the difference between the CI-600 and the 602? So the CI-600 uh, has a uh, diameter of two and a half inches. This was our original design. Uh, this two and a half inch uh, 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 scan head uh, fits into our tubes that we provide. Uh, we, may need, we have in our facility, we can send out uh, you know, more whenever you need them. Um, but then we noticed that um, in order to fit the needs of people that already had tubes installed uh, uh, that were uh, of a narrower diameter, um, we did create the CI-602, which is a 1.8 inch uh, in, uh, diameter, which fits inside of the two inch inner diameter tubes that a lot of people already had installed in their fields. Um, so in order to meet that need, that's why the 602 is created. So they are uh, in essence, the exact same instrument, um, the 600 just being a little bit uh, of a wider gauge uh, and the 602 being a narrower gauge uh, instrument. Uh, the only other difference being that the CI-602 does go up to 1200 DPI uh, for a scanning resolution. So our analysis software uh, that comes with this uh, is called RootSnap. And so RootSnap uh, uh, is a multi-touch interface. It is optimized for touchscreen uh, uh, tablets or touchscreen computers. Um, and so what this, what this allows is for the user to upload those images that are acquired from uh, the scan head, from the uh, acquisition software, um, which is actually just an image file. It is not 
There is no any kind of special uh, uh, type of file that 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 is the result of taking a scan. No, it's just it is just an image. Um, and so uh, uh, with that, we just simply upload that image into the RootSnap software. Um, and uh, it allows you to trace your roots uh, either using uh, the touchscreen feature or using a mouse. Uh, and you can get measurements of uh, root length, area, volume, diameter, and branching angle, um, all, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, all appearing on the screen as you trace your roots. And uh, so it can report average values as well as your individual root data. Um, and then also uh, uh, you uh, can use the automated snap to root functionality to make the tracing part easier. So uh, we do have a uh, kind of built in snap to root functionality uh, where as you trace, uh, it'll kind of automatically detect where that root might be. And, uh, and it is, so it is a comprehensive root uh, uh, analysis and image analysis uh, a package. And uh, you can use it to observe, uh, uh, you know, over uh, a, a series of different uh, uh, times. Uh, you can look at images from, you know, across your entire growing season and compare uh, and see how much roots have grown or died back. Um, and, and overall, uh, it is a, a fairly intuitive and efficient uh, user interface, we believe, uh, for helping. Um, so it's uh, similar to a, uh, another, uh, another popular software that people are uh, utilizing in these root mapping uh, and, and root tracing uh, uh, image analysis is uh, WinRISO. So this is kind of uh, our, our WinRISO that we offer free that comes with our, uh, our instruments. So before I get into these studies, let's just really quick go over, I've already kind of discussed some of the applications that the, the 600 and the 602 can be used for. Um, so obviously looking at root physiology, observing development and function of a plant's root system uh, over a period of time. Um, but where we see it used often really is in agriculture. So looking at um, establishment and rooting of new crops throughout a growing season, uh, and then also looking at things like early disease detection. So being able to detect and diagnose plant pathogens and disorders uh, before you can actually visualize anything above ground. So that's a really uh, invaluable tool to have so that you, uh, it isn't too late before you can intervene um, and, 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 uh, and see you know, what can be done to mitigate this disease. Um, and then also there's a lot of other uh, uh, you know, uh, applications that this has been used for. Uh, so looking at uh, uh, look, timing soil amendment applications uh, with root flush, uh, looking at efficacy of fertilizer and other soil treatments is a pretty, another popular application. So um, really, uh, uh, it's just a really powerful overall tool to be able to non-destructively uh, uh, look at root growth and root and, uh, and look at root health. Um, and, 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 and a lot of people use that either as a independent, <clears throat> as we'll see, as an independent uh, uh, kind of uh, application and, and, and focus on, on that. But it, a lot of people also um, will go ahead and take that and, and, and use it as a part of a bigger picture study, which we'll also see um, here in, uh, in the coming studies I'm about to discuss. So let's go ahead and jump in to some studies. So this first one that I wanted to uh, uh, showcase for you guys, uh, uh, this one is uh, uh, titled Mini Rhizotron as an in-situ tool for assessing sugarcane root system growth and distribution. Uh, I chose this study because this is a really, uh, a really good paper to read if you are a person who uh, is very interested in utilizing Mini Rhizotron systems, or utilizing the CI600 or the 602, uh, for a root study and you've never actually used a uh, mini rhizotron system before uh, and you aren't really sure uh, what kind of the best practices might be or, or what variables can play into uh, you know the, the effectiveness of utilizing uh, the CI 600 or the 602. So um, in this study uh, essentially it's really just looking at uh, um, all the best practices, all the key kind of concepts uh, of utilizing a uh, the CI 600 specifically um, uh, to look at uh, in their case sugarcane root systems and looking at the growth and the distribution of sugarcane roots, and so as you can see from these images, 
actually, uh, they look at uh, a variety of different um, uh, factors that can influence how effective uh, 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 your, your system can be. And so looking at things like um, installing the tube completely perpendicular to the soil surface versus at a 45 degree angle. Um, and then looking at things like um, uh, protecting uh, the, the tube at the soil surface uh, from water and light um, and uh, looking at, uh, uh, you know, taking scans with that protection both on and that protection off. Um, and, and so that's what this bottom image shows is, is, is showing kind of what they determined to be to help give them the best uh, resolution images and the best images they could get of their root systems, how they went about doing that. Uh, utilizing this water and light protection um, of this black uh, uh, polyethylene. And, uh, and as you can see, uh, at the bottom row of this uh, bottom image here, um, E is the picture of uh, the picture that they were able to acquire of their roots uh, using the CI600. And then F is a picture of it once they've analyzed it and traced the roots on RootSnap. Uh, so uh, with, you know, with this study, they kind of Kind of hashed out what the best practices would be um, when it came to uh, exactly how they would need to install and how they need to protect or cover the tube head in order to get uh, their most ideal and, and highest resolution and uh, clearest picture of their roots. So I thought this is a great study for those who are just getting into it, uh, who, or who are interested in doing roots, who want to read more about it and kind of see how it would uh, fit into their application. Uh, this is a good starting study to, to read. The next study I chose uh, kind of showcases, uh, as I was talking about earlier, it showcases how root studies don't have to be uh, a, a kind of a singular study. So this is a really good example of using root analysis as a part of a overall greater objective, an overall bigger picture kind of study. So this was titled Fruit Load Limits Root Growth, Summer Vegetative Shoot Development, and Flowering in Alternate Bearing Nattercot Mandarin Trees. So what they did here is actually root development and root growth was just a part of looking at the overall reasons why uh, when a mandarin tree in South Africa grown under commercial conditions, uh, uh, when it um, has an on year and it's in its very high fruit bearing tree, uh, why it then has an off year. And so just trying to understand all the mechanisms behind what is going on, observing everything from uh, looking at new vegetative shoot growth uh, to uh, looking at, uh, you know, number of blossoms, number of fruit, uh, to looking at the carbohydrate and starch levels in the roots and in the vegetative shoots and the leaves um, and, and looking at the root development and just getting a very broad overall picture, but with great detail, knowing exactly what mechanisms are happening in, uh, that cause this kind of shift between on, season, you know, on year, off year, where high fruit, high fruit bearing to low fruit bearing. Um, and so this is a great study uh, uh, that they that they published a very thorough study, um, and they were they basically were able to see that uh, 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 in essence that uh, when a tree has an on year and it's and it's got that many fruit that it's a it's a carbohydrate suck and it and it uh, causes these roots and the vegetative growth to and the vegetative shoots to to uh, it's cause it to stunt their growth and so caught which in turn manifests itself as in the next in the following season uh, an off year for the tree uh, and so uh, correlating that all to uh, looking you know uh, uh, the carbohydrate levels uh, trying to determine where the carbohydrates are going um, uh, in the in the tree where it's that's being you know allocated so looking at uh, the carbohydrates in the roots versus the leaves versus the the fruit um, and so uh, they were able to kind of just de determine and show and, and understand that this is what happens uh, when a tree has too much, uh, essentially too much fruit um, on it and it's bearing too much fruit that, uh, so, that it so much fruit that it can't even handle um, uh, uh, and, and sustain normal root growth and vegetative shoot development. So really cool study. 
uh, I definitely recommend people check it out. Uh, and it was a good example of how, how root assessment and root imaging using uh, the CI 600 can be part of a bigger picture kind of study. It doesn't have to be a singularly focused study. And then this uh, last study before we move on to uh, 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 our guest speaker is uh, uh, one that uh, we kind of like to showcase when we go around uh, to conferences when, uh, when we were still able to do that. Uh, so this is uh, from uh, Dr. Ikeda in Japan, and this is just a demonstration uh, that shows that uh, our CI 600 system can be used in a hydroponic culture uh, uh, system. So uh, really all this study was, was uh, initially was just to see if, if uh, our tubes are able to be used uh, in a completely underwater kind of situation. So, um, and when I say completely, I don't mean the tube is 100% underwater, but most of the tube is underwater. Um, as you can see from this image, uh, uh, the, the kind of the diagram, the, the graphic uh, on the top of the screen there, um, the water level is, is slightly below the top of the, the tube itself, um, and, and the tube is then used, or the, the head is then inserted into the tube without fear of any sort of water uh, infiltrating the tube itself. So uh, this actually demonstrates something that uh, we also have uh, ensured that all of our tubes are uh, watertight um, at the bottom, uh, so there is no risk of getting any water uh, into the bottom of your tubes, no matter if you plant them in, in an aqua aquaculture or hydroponic uh, hyd uh, situ uh, situation, or if you're doing it into you know clay soil or whatever, as long as you are uh, 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 making sure that you are taking proper care of the tubes, there is no risk of, of water uh, getting into the tube. Uh, where there is risk is if you thought that you could completely submerge your tube in water, uh, you're probably going to have a root awakening when that water uh, then just starts flowing in from the top of the tube. Um, but this was a great study by Dr. Ikeda and it really helped demonstrate uh, uh, all the versatility of, of, of uh, use, utilizing a mini risotron system like the CI600. And so um, uh, they decided to perform some studies just looking at uh, uh, various root parameters uh, with uh, treatment uh, uh, of uh, uh, salt stress or uh, aluminum chloride um, to just see, uh, kind of preliminarily see, uh, you know, how well this uh, uh, CI600 can take images in this hydroponic system. And, and they got really good results. Uh, everything uh, kind of makes sense to uh, uh, what you would expect um, for the results with the salt stress, the control obviously having the most uh, uh, root length and surface area and volume, um, and then increasing concentrations of salts uh, causing the roots to be uh, subdued, the root growth to be subdued. Uh, and this is all done with uh, tomato, uh, tomato plants. Um, and, uh, and it was a really good demonstration of, of exactly how versatile uh, this instrument can be. And so uh, those are just three studies. Uh, we wanted to kind of keep this short so that we allowed proper time for uh, Dr. Rossi's uh, presentation. And uh, uh, if uh, you have any questions about these, please put them in the Q&A chat. Um, Susie will also uh, post links to these studies. Um, I don't know if we have a link for Dr. Ikeda's study. I know that this was uh, given to us uh, from him directly, but it, it probably is on the internet somewhere, I would say. so. Um, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Lorenzo Rossi. Uh, he is an assistant professor in the Horticultural Sciences Department at the University of Florida. And uh, so Dr. Rossi is going to be talking to us today about his project. Um, his main research area is in plant root biology. Uh, he's a horticulturist uh, with specific expertise related to root anatomy, dynamics, and root system architecture. Uh, so when it comes to the Q&A session, uh, if you have uh, any questions directly related to Dr. Rossi's research or uh, about uh, anything related to um, just uh, general questions about roots, uh, Dr. Rossi is going to be your guy to answer those questions for sure. Um, and so Dr. Rossi's research program focuses on improving root health and growth on HLB-affected citrus. Um, and that's uh, actually a, a 
pretty funny that uh, that's exactly Dr. Rossi's research area. I'm pretty sure that in our last webinar, I also presented a study about HLB uh, 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 affected citrus. So um, it'll be cool to learn more about that. Uh, and so uh, he's uh, helped lead the, to the development of environmentally sound and effective citrus management methods. And so uh, this is uh, kind of exactly one of the applications that we always uh, uh, envision for the CI 600 is, is in the uh, agricultural uh, world, uh, uh, being able to uh, help develop and mitigate uh, uh, disease uh, and, and stressors. So. I'm really excited about Dr. Rossi's talk. And so without further ado, uh, I would like to uh, let Dr. Rossi go ahead and take over. Uh, Dr. Rossi, are you there? Yes, can you, can you hear me? Awesome, we can hear you loud and clear. So go yeah. ahead and if I'm not advancing the slide, uh, uh, then go ahead and just tell me to advance the slide for you. Okay, thank you. So um, as, as um, uh, Mr. George, say, uh, my name is Lorenzo Rossi. I work for the University of Florida, and uh, my my previous expertise was on uh, root anatomy. I did my 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 mostly on my PhD work was on root barriers, root anatomy, and um, and then uh, for um, uh, this uh, job as an assistant professor here at the University of Florida. We are working on um, uh, field trials in um, HLB affected citrus. So, um, if you can please um, go to the next slide. Um, we are located in a research station. So, we are um, sorry, um, the one. It, yeah, we are located in a research station in the Indian River um, region of Florida, which is on the uh, east coast of Florida. And uh, it's, uh, it's three hours from Gainesville, which is the main campus. And we are 12 professors there. And our research is mostly applied. And we have graduate students, we have visiting scientists. It's, um, it's, a, it's a nice center and we can really, really work on um, on applied research to help um, growers and to help the the industry um, please um, next slide uh, this is my lab so we have four graduate students we have a biological scientist and hopefully we will have uh, some visiting scientists too now with this um, the, the the virus has been a, a little bit tricky for us to, to work from from, from our center, so we are all working from home, but hopefully uh, by, by next semester, we will be able to, to go back to normal or at least something more normal. So we have four graduate students and two of them are working with the um, mini rhizotron mini directly, um, Lucas and, and, and John. Um, Jonathan has been working with the mini rhizotron in the past. He's probably work on that again. And Ricardo is more working on uh, uh, hydroponics and hydroponics, so studying root system architecture in greenhouse settings. Um, please. So, why why is important to study like um, root traits in um, in the HLB era? So, um, if you can please go ahead. So Florida main agriculture crop is citrus. That's a, that's a, that's a fact. Uh, and if you see here from the nine, from the twenties, the production dropped almost 60%. And now it's almost 75%. And this drop in production is because of a disease. The disease is called citrus greeny or uh, one glom being HLB. It arrived in um, Miami uh, like almost 15 years ago, and he find a vector here in Florida and has been transmitted to uh, all our our citrus here. If you can please um, move to the other slide, and so as you can see, uh, pretty much all our counties all produce citrus greening produce a uh, citrus producing county are affected by this disease. And it's called citrus green because you, you can see you have this, this yellow um, uh, 
uh, model on the on the leaves and um, and is spread into Texas, California, other states. Now the difference there is that they have a different weather, they have different type of soil, so it's not really finding a good environment like the one in Florida. Because if you have a disease and you are in Florida, you have humidity, you have a lot of sun, you, you don't have changing weather, you don't have changing seasons. And so the disease love that kind of environment. And that's why the citrus green loved our state that much. Um, please. So, um, what, 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 how does it work? So it's a bacteria, it's a Liberibacter asiaticus is the bacteria, and it's called Candidatus because so far we are not, we, we, we haven't been able to, to culture it. So we assume this is the bacteria, the, that is the bacterium that is responsible, but so far, since it, it, it's a flowing limit, so this bacteria lives inside the phloem, so it needs no oxygen, a really, really dark environment, a lot of sugars, a specific uh, pH. It's really, really hard to uh, having them um, in a lab, in a Petri dish. So we have, we, we, we never, we haven't been able to, 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 to culture it. And it has a vector, which is this fly, it's called a psyllid, is a, a, a Asian citrus psyllid. And it, um, it goes, the, the, the psyllid goes feed in on the phloem and transmit the, the bacteria. And so from the phloem here on the leaves, the bacteria moves inside the roots, replicates into the roots and clog all the vascular system of the plant. So then the nutrients are now moving from the roots to the leaf, and then you have a lot of unbalances in your uh, trees. And then you know, if you don't do anything, or if you just don't uh, think the citrus green is the problem in like five or six years, you're gonna lose your, your, your citrus growth. Um, next slide, please. So why is important to use mini rhizotron in our study because it's a new system it allows us to to see what the citrus greenness is really doing to the roots because we know that the roots and i put that here in bold uh the citrus tree the roots of the citrus tree act as the sinks so it's really, really important for us to monitor root growth and development under citrus greening condition. It is, at, um, and the other important thing is it gave us an idea of how roots are growing and developing under different uh, environmental conditions here in, uh, in Florida. And um, please go to the, other slide. Um, so what, what we can do with our study, we started, uh, I started my position here almost two years ago and, uh, and all these mini rhizotrons that we stole are now in the field for almost like one year. So we are, we are starting to get um, a good amount of results. How can we use the results? Um, there is one important thing. If we can find some root traits, some, some varieties, some new rootstocks that can confer tolerance because of their particular, their particular roots, so their, their particular root traits, that can be one thing that we are looking. The other thing is to correlate root growth with nutrients. So right now we are, we are using a lot of nutrients and most of our recommendation came from just observing the above part of the tree, never observing the below ground. What we are trying to do here is to give the right amount of nutrient that is helping actually the roots because the roots are the one that are uptaking. So we are trying to make recommendation based on root growth and development in just, in, instead of just doing that based on the above ground. So that's another thing we are we are doing. Um, we are we are also trying to help breeding programs to see if we have shallow roots, deeper roots can help with the with the citrus greening. And also, of course, all these pictures we are taking um, can be used in uh, in deeper studies. So if we can correlate some specific trait with some genes 
or or some physiology that that can help us our 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 studies as well uh, please um, next slide so we have um, right now four field studies on roots we have different trees from different ages we have new really really young trees and older trees and here in the river we have more than 200 mini rides that are installed and across the state of florida with other collaborators we have dr johnson in lake alfred dr albrecht in um in imoca the other two research station we have more than 1,000 mini rides that are installed in across the state of florida trying to monitor the the citrus greening uh, disease uh, please um, so this is what we do um, this is one of the uh, graduate students in the lab we put the the the, the we make a hole and then we put the, 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 the transparent tube inside the, the, the hole we make. Now, Florida soils are pretty sandy, so it's really easy to, to, to drill, uh, even with this hand hauger. So we don't really need a big drill or anything like that. And, um, and then we, we put, the, we put the, the tubes, we put water all around the tubes to remove all the air um, that can be create problem with uh, air bubble around the tubes that can affect the, the picture. And then here in Florida, what we do, we use covers because it's really, really hot here and the sun um, can, uh, the, 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 the normal lead that the tubes have. Uh, for, for our weather, sometimes it's, it's not enough. So we put an extra cover on that, just, just a white pipe or something to protect against the, the sun and and we have a lot of water here in the summer we have a lot of rainy uh, because of the hurricane so we're trying to protect our tubes as much as we can um, next slide and so this is this is just what i said so we have this uh, this 200 mini rise turn installed here um we use we use both rootstock and wind riser to analyze the pictures we hope to have um, a publication out by the end of the year so i'm not really talking about a lot of data in this seminar because i want to we, we st we're still going through all the analysis but so far we are we are getting we are getting really really interesting results especially with the with the nutrients management so be being able to have a, a nutrient management man, management system based on root health i think it's really really important because it's the best way that you're giving just what the roots need and it's a direct way to measure to measure um uh, how much nutrients you're really gonna give to the to the to your your tree especially here in florida with our sandy soil we Sometimes we give a, little, a, little, a lot of nitrogen, but the roots are not even taking it because it drains and everything goes into the water table. So uh, please, next slide. So as I said, uh, what we are doing here uh, is to, we are trying to get the optimal nutrient concentrations uh, based on root health. We are trying to, um, use these tubes these mini rhizotron to have a better understanding of the root system architecture and to try to see if uh we can create a or with the breeders a rootstock that can have a better root system for hlb uh, conditions and uh, and also what we are trying to do here is to take picture of the roots but also to 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 monitor the the rhizosphere so microbiome the, the microbes that are growing around the roots if specific microbes are affecting the root system better than the other one and we know that there are plant growth promoting rights of bacteria that can help in the nutrient uptake so this is this is one of the projects we are we are we are we are going forward hopefully hopefully we'll be able to start this uh, by the end of the year um 
Uh, next slide, please. So again, um, this is this is this is what um, a root system for um, a grapefruit here in the river looks like. So it's a really really shallow root system. We have a really really shallow water table, so the roots cannot go too deep, and they will go really really wide, but not deep. So we are talking about like probably 12 feet high, but like only three or four feet deep. And this is pretty typical here for Florida. So when you when you when, when you put out your tubes, we try to have a 45 angle, and um, and you know the tubes are, are are quite long, and we can get three windows taking pictures. So we we always try to take more picture for the first and second window, and it's we usually don't go that deep to the third to the third window taking taking pictures. Uh, please next slide. Um, I just want to say thank you to our sponsor, to USDA, the Citrus Research and Development Foundation, and the University of Florida. I was able to buy the tubes with those specific grants, and I was able to buy a camera. Hopefully, I can buy another camera soon because it's uh, it's nice to have a backup when we have calibration when you're using a lot of tubes. So um, I'm trying to put that in my proposals so I can have a back camera and and I think that's it uh, I think there is a last slide with my contacts information um, you have you have one more slide okay yes um, if you have any question if you want to know more about my research this is my email we are on Twitter we are on Facebook we so feel free to contact me and if there are any questions, I'm here. I saw Lucas Allman is here too, is one of the students in my lab. He's the one that actually do the job in the field. So if you have, I'm the one that pay the bills, but sometimes I'm not in the field with him. He's the one that is the field every day, taking picture and putting the pictures and putting the tubes. So he may, if I don't have an answer, he may, he may help with technical questions as well. Uh, thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Asi. That was a really, really uh, insightful presentation. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that paper when you guys get it published. I'm really excited about that data. So um, yeah, that concludes our, uh, our webinar today. So uh, just kind of going to wrap things up and then we'll, uh, we'll go into the Q&A session. So uh, today we, we talked about uh, some of the applications and use cases for the 600 and the 602. Um, this technology uh, can be applied to so many different fields of research, uh, most commonly used in agriculture, um, but uh, definitely certainly used in other applications like forestry and, and ecology, things of that nature. Um, so uh, really any researcher in, in the academic, private, or government sector that requires uh, some sort of uh, uh, fast and reliable and non-destructive way to analyze root images can really benefit from, from utilizing the 600 and the 602. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, this instrument uh, um, is able to acquire these images. Uh, they're uh, fairly high resolution images, uh, all non-destructively. And the root snap software that comes with our instrument uh, uh, can also allow you to um, determine root measurements just from tracing the roots on the image. Um, so uh, overall, uh, I, that was a very uh, informative presentation from Dr. Rossi, and I hope you guys learned uh, some stuff about the, uh, the instruments. Uh, and of course, we have the Q&A session coming up, so it looks like we have quite a few questions. Uh, so hopefully everyone can stick around for that. Um, if you have any uh, application-related inquiries or problems, uh, you can contact myself or Eric Munez Garcia, who's our other application scientist here at CID Bioscience. Uh, we're both more than happy to help. Um, uh, if you have uh, support issues where you're, something was wrong with your instrument, uh, I will uh, direct you to uh, contact our support team directly. Um, just really quick, gonna uh, talk about two uh, uh, things that we're really excited about here at CID. 
Uh, first is our upcoming release of our new leaf spectrometer. So it's our CI710 Spectra View, and it is uh, going to be awesome. It's a new form factor. It's the same concept as um, our previous uh, model of our CI710 leaf miniature leaf spectrometer. Uh, this time it's a brand new form factor. As you can see, it's all on one instrument, touch screen. Um, you'll be able to look at absorbance, transflectance, or transmittance and reflectance all uh, at the exact same time. Um, it has all the same built-in indices and, and even some more new built-in indices. Uh, and also we'll be able to uh, be utilized for PL, uh, like PLS, partial least squares regression modeling, um, and also fruit maps compatibility. Um, something we recently released that we're also still excited about is our F751 Kiwi quality meter. This is on our Felix Instruments side of the business. Um, so uh, this is a tool that can instantly and non-destructively assess uh, um, dry matter and bricks in kiwi fruit. Uh, and so those are important indices for uh, harvest uh, uh, and maturity uh, so determination. So we're really excited about that release as well. Um, if you have any questions about those or any inquiries, you can contact our sales department. So if you would like to uh, uh, get connected with us, uh, we have lots of different avenues uh, where you can uh, get in touch with us. Um, the uh, best way to keep up updated with what's going on is to check out our website, www.cid-inc.com. Um, you can always call us. Uh, you can always send an email to us. Um, and also uh, follow us on social media. So uh, we have uh, a Twitter, a Facebook, and a LinkedIn profile. Uh, so please uh, check us out. Um, and I know nobody's traveling right now, or they shouldn't be unless the, they have some kind of essential business happening. But um, when this all blows over, uh, uh, and if you, you are in the area, uh, you are always welcome to stop by our headquarters uh, in Camas, Washington. Um, and we're always happy to give tours and, and, and show what we're working on and everything. So, um, yeah, let's uh, uh, if, go ahead and get started on the questions. But before that, um, uh, if you guys uh, uh, want to quote uh, for uh, the CI 600 or the 602, um, uh, all you have to do is click the tiny URL. Uh, Susie will put that in the chat for you guys, this tiny URL uh, for the root webinar. Um, it will give you instant access to a quote where it will give you options on uh, different uh, payment methods, on, on uh, um, different warranty options. Uh, it'll be all right there on the one quote for you, really easy to navigate. So if you'd like a quote, uh, go ahead and click that link. Um, if you have a question that is uh, 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 specific to an application, so say you have a research project coming up, and you're not sure if the CI 600 or the 602 is a right fit and you wanna to talk to someone about it, uh, I am your person as well as Eric uh, Garcia, Eric Munoz Garcia, he's our other application scientist. Um, so if you would like to uh, request a consultation, they're always free. Uh, you can always uh, uh, set up a time for us to have a Zoom call, a video call, and we can discuss uh, all the ins and outs of your project and how our instruments can um, uh, help you uh, achieve your goals uh, for your project. So to request a consultation, go ahead and click that uh, the tiny URL uh, 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 forward slash product consult. Uh, Susie will also be posting that in the chat as well. So let's go ahead and move on to questions. We have quite a few of them. So uh, uh, we will try to get through them as, as quickly as possible while still answering uh, your question. Um, so that uh, people that want to, uh, you know, so we can have as many people uh, hearing the answers to these questions as possible. So I'm going to go ahead and open up the question and answer, and these will be answered in the order that they were sent. Um, so uh, the first question uh, was sent uh, is asking, what is the functional distance between the instrument and pad? Is it in inches, feet, yards? So um, I believe this is a question referring to what is the maximum focal distance for the scan head. Um, I do not believe I actually uh, 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 talked about that. So uh, uh, the, the maximum distance uh, from the uh, outside of the tube uh, that can be imaged is eight millimeters. So eight millimeters from the tube. So anything uh, uh, that is beyond eight millimeters will not show up in the image. Uh, it needs to be within eight millimeters or ideally touching the tube in order to be imaged. 
So uh, the next question is, uh, uh, and I, uh, I talked about this in the study, in the, one of our studies is, uh, I guess they are waterproof and I can leave them in a hydroponic system to record root growth. Uh, yes, the bottoms of the tubes are watertight. Um, however, you need to access the top of the tube in order to put the scan head in. And so that is where a lot of the issues can arise. Uh, and so uh, anyone that has had issues with water in their tubes, um, uh, uh, it, is, uh, um, it is a symptom of not having adequate protection over the top of the tube where the, uh, the actual scan head will be inserted into the tube. And so it is, uh, as that first study that I, that I uh, talked about, it's really important to take a lot of precautions to ensure that water uh, doesn't uh, get in as well as, uh, you know, depending on the climate that you're in, as Dr. Rossi pointed out, you know, protection from heat, uh, uh, protection from extreme cold, things like that. Um, uh, you want to take those precautions to ensure. Uh, and also, I want to make it clear that if you, if you are concerned about water getting in your tube and you think there might be water in your tube, do not insert your scan head until you are certain that the, the tube, the inside of the tube is dry because you will damage your scan head and um, uh, then that's not gonna be fun for you. Uh, so make sure that before every time, even if it hasn't rained before you insert your scan head that you check your tubes to make sure that there's uh, no debris in there, that there's no water in there, anything that can uh, uh, kind of uh, damage the actual scan head. The next question is, is the shape of the image space a cylinder? So technically, yes. Uh, uh, if you think about it, the scan head is inserted into the tube and then it rotates 360 degrees taking an image. The image itself comes out as a flat image, but what you're taking is kind of the inside uh, or, uh, diameter of a, of a cylinder that is eight millimeters outside of, eight, mil, uh, eight millimeters thick and it's, and it's outside of the tube itself. So. Technically, I guess the answer to that question is the image space is a cylinder, but your images are normal flat images that, that, that uh, are acquired. The next question is, can we know the number of roots per tree? Uh, so the best way to go about uh, uh, addressing a, uh, a question like that, um, you would have to install, uh, be very thorough in the installation of your tubes. Uh, to make sure that you are imaging uh, every possible, uh, uh, you know, area of your tree. Otherwise, you're going to have to uh, uh, perform some sort of estimation uh, based on a calculation or, or, or modeling um, in order to determine the number of roots uh, in your tree. Uh, the next question is, does the software automatically provide results or do you need to trace individual roots? Uh, so you do need to trace roots. There is no uh, inherent automatic uh, uh, root detection that automatically traces all the roots. If that's uh, kind of, I think that's kind of what you're asking. There is still root tracing involved. Um, the, the feature that uh, uh, kind of makes that a little bit easier is the snap to root feature. Um, uh, but it does still involve uh, physical tracing of the roots. Uh, the next question is, how do you align a time series of 360 degree images? So um, actually, honestly, for that question, I would like to direct you to go ahead and email us directly because in order to be able to show you and demonstrate how it's possible, um, it's going to require more than just me talking into the, into the screen here. Uh, so uh, I can uh, please contact our support team and they can absolutely uh, uh, help uh, answer your question of how to align um, your time series of images. Uh, the next question is, are you able to do a, oh, I actually just disappeared. Uh, the, the question was, are we able to do, to do a demonstration in Canada right now? Um, unfortunately, no. So uh, just to let you guys know, uh, our company is still operating. Uh, we are uh, taking every possible measure to, uh, uh, to mitigate any sort of spread of, of the virus. And so uh, people that are uh, able to work from home are working from home. 
um, all uh, of the other essential job functions, um, our production team, our shipping department, uh, some of the Q, uh, QA and also some of the engineering team uh, are all still uh, going into the office um, and keeping their, their uh, six feet apart. Um, but uh, uh, right now the, uh, we have uh, uh, decided to not do any travel um, until uh, we get other, uh, uh, otherwise notified by the federal government uh, or, or the, um, the state that it is okay to start traveling again. Um, so the next question is, do these instruments distinguish the roots of a particular plant or just provide roots growing surroundings, uh, the access tube, uh, especially if I wish to use it for annual plants like tomato, cucumber, pepper, et cetera. Uh, so it, okay, so you're asking if it does root identification. So um, uh, the, the law, uh, the short answer is, is no, it won't identify roots for you. Uh, so uh, uh, for that, um, uh, you know, we are looking into advancing this technology into uh, kind of the spectroscopy uh, field as well to incorporate spectroscopy in order to be able to do uh, 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 root um, identification. Um, but right now it is just an imaging system. So all you're going to get is an image of any of the roots surrounding the tube. So, um, uh, you know, if, if you have if you know for a fact that w one of the plants uh, that you have has mostly fine fibrous roots and the other one has mostly larger pioneer roots and, and not a lot of fibrous, you know, fine roots, then that would be an easy way for you to distinguish. But however, for the most part, it's probably going to just look like uh, uh, all the same plant um, unless you are able to, uh, uh, you know, uh, unless you are able to visually dis distinguish between the two root systems. So it's really up to, um, you know, how, how, exp how much expertise does your eye have in identifying uh, the roots of the plant. Um, the next question is, uh, hi Susie, I noticed the webinar has been recorded. Is it going to be available later? Yeah, absolutely. This webinar is going to be available later. We are recording. So uh, this is going to be sent out to everyone who registered for the, uh, with the webinar. So um, even if people weren't able to join us at this time, um, uh, it will be uh, uh, available uh, uh, and it will also be able to, we'll also be putting it up uh, on the internet as well. So um, the next question is, uh, please provide a link of the second study. Um, so Aileen? Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I didn't have a link for that second study. So if you uh, have that available okay. and you can put that into the chat, yep. uh, I have a couple people ask for it. Okay. Yes. I will put that in the chat. Um, it is from AS, I think it was ASHS actually, uh, that I found that on. So um, I will put that up uh, as soon as I uh, can get to it. Um, and I'll probably be at the end of this question and answer session, but I, uh, I will provide that for you guys. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, uh, so the, the next question is the hardest part of using the CS 600 is the root analysis using root snap manual tracing of roots. Um, uh, so it's very difficult and time consuming. Is there automatic analysis for this image? Uh, so, uh, this is like, easily the most uh, asked question, one of the most asked questions about uh, the root snap software is, uh, is there an easier way to do it besides tracing the roots? Um, for now, uh, that's, that's the only system that we have in place. Um, we are uh, looking at making a lot of improvements this year um, and hopefully uh, being looking at, um, auto, uh, you know, automating that, that process, but that is a quite a, a task um, to undertake. So, uh, you know, be on the lookout for updates to the software, but uh, for now, uh, it'll, it just requires manual tracing. And then we have another question about, okay, the links for the studies. Um, for the, the study from Dr. Ikeda, um, I don't think we have, we don't have an actual link for that uh, because uh, that was sent to us directly by Dr. Ikeda. Um, I, I believe we probably could find it on the internet if I type that, uh, that title in uh, with his name. Uh, we probably could find it somewhere uh, posted, but I believe um, uh, it was a poster presented uh, uh, 
uh, at a conference and I'm not, I'm trying to remember which one it was, but um, uh, I will look for, I will look for an online uh, reference for that where everyone can access it. Um, and I will, and then the next question is again, asking for references. So uh, I will provide the link for the, the studies uh, after I'm done answering these questions. Uh, how much minimum tube is required for general experiment for root growth? Uh, really, uh, the, I guess the absolute minimum um, you would need is uh, uh, something that is really determined by how deep you think your root system is going to go. So even if you have a really shallow root system um, and it's something that you can uh, uh, do not in the field but grow in, in uh, some sort of you know, uh, uh, greenhouse environment and you can create uh, 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 your own kind of growing box. Um, we've had people that um, look at really, really shallow root systems, but they install their tubes. They create these boxes to install tubes horizontally. And so they have, you know, they have about, you know, 25 different tubes installed horizontally along this grow box so that they can see every single inch and they don't have to worry about um, you know, installing, you know, installing depth because they just can control exactly how far down uh, they want their tubes to be and they can still get a great really wide image. So um, how, how deep you want to go is really dependent on, on, on the root systems you are studying. And uh, the minimum, I mean, the absolute minimum distance you need is enough to get the scan head so that you actually have some of the the actual scan head portion into the tube. So realistically, I guess if you really uh, were that determined, you could get images of, you know, of a, inside of a tube that's, you know, five to six inches or something like that deep, but you would only get the tiny little sliver of a whole image because the scan window is, is uh, almost a foot long or so. So you would really need to, uh, you would have a whole section of just blank uh, image and then a, a small sliver of image. So um, yeah, that's, that's, that's my answer for that question. Um, the next question was, I missed which is on tree and off tree in the previous slide. Uh, so that, that study that I posted about the Mandarin trees, the South African study, um, the on trees uh, were the ones that uh, uh, had a high fruit yield, like a large amount of a large fruit bearing tree, and then the off ones were the ones that were low fruit bearing. Uh, and so uh, the, the on trees uh, would be on for one growing season, and then the next season they would be off. And then the off trees would be on for the next growing season, and they would kind of switch back and forth like that. Um, how, the next question is, how is it calibrated uh, every time you use it or once a time when experiment will start? Uh, we recommend uh, uh, um, uh, calibrating it. Well, once you get it, once you receive it, you'll want to calibrate it. Um, and then uh, realistically, it doesn't hurt to uh, calibrate uh, before every, like, you know, large, you know, day of, of large use. But um, you only need to calibrate if you, if you notice something is off. If you notice that your images aren't, aren't aligning uh, correctly and something's going wrong, that's when uh, you definitely need to calibrate. But um, actually, this would be a good question uh, for uh, somebody who actually uses it on a daily basis. Uh, Lucas, actually, if you're still on, um, it would be great to hear from you how often you uh, calibrate your, your guys' instrument or how you decide. Oh, hold on one second. You're muted. Give me one second. You hear me now? Yep. There you go. All right. Um, it's a set number of scans. Um, I don't recall how many. I think it's like every 500, if I can think. But uh, yeah, it's like a set number of scans. Gotcha. Yeah. So uh, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be every time you use it. But if you do take 500 scans in one day, then you might want to calibrate it the next day. So uh, thanks, Lucas, for the help on that one. Uh, the next question is, has this technology been used to study root hairs? Um, so as far as I know, uh, uh, the technology is mostly uh, uh, used on, on uh, you know, crops and other uh, larger 
uh, trees and plants that have um, you know, a, a, a fairly, uh, you know, some sometimes fairly fibrous root structures, but um, to really get down to looking at the extremely, like extremely small fibers uh, requires a very high resolution. So going up to the 1200 uh, DPI resolution on the 602, the 602 model, for example. Um, and uh, those scan times can take quite a long time. So if you have a lot of plants to study or a bigger field, it's not really a uh, feasible option. Um, I don't personally have any, uh, off the top of my head, have any studies that I can think of where uh, root hairs were specifically uh, looked into. But um, if you want to email me and we can uh, and we can discuss it more, uh, I I can um, do some more research into it and see uh, what studies are out there. The next question is. Uh, how to apply the CI 600 to the coastal wetland immersed. Um, so uh, actually, uh, 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 if you want to go ahead and send me uh, your uh, uh, information, if you want to email me um, and we can talk about this, um, that's a really cool application. I can send you uh, uh, Dr. Akeda's paper about how they uh, developed their um, hydroponic system. And um, I think the biggest challenge is that with the hydroponic system, it was a lot more controlled than a coastal wetland is. So, uh, um, but we can we can discuss uh, uh, how we might um, uh, mitigate any, uh, you know, a water or, or, or things getting into the tube. Um, uh, but yeah, please uh, send me an email. It'd be great to talk to you about that. Um, the next question is about the tundra study. So uh, about the people that are uh, using our tubes out in the tundra. So yes, I uh, and uh, we, to get a reference for this study, please go ahead and send me an email, um, and I will uh, uh, I will find that for you to send to you. Um, uh, that that is a, a great uh, study there. So. Oh, there we go. So for hydroponic field applications where the water levels change, uh, i.e. like the coastal wetlands, um, do you have a range of lengths of the clear tube? So yeah, so the tubes actually come um, in one length uh, and they're uh, a little over, they're uh, 105 uh, centimeters long. We can actually send you a variety of lengths of tubes. Um, and then also you yourself can cut tubes to whatever length you think is, is best for your application. So um, if you have, if you're worried about, uh, you know, 105 uh, centimeters not being tall enough, um, then uh, we can uh, talk about getting you uh, even large, even longer tubes um, for your study. So uh, just go ahead and um, uh, if you are, uh, uh, interested, please send us an email and we can discuss, um, uh, you know, what you, what your specific needs might be. Uh, the next question is, uh, okay, so another question about how to apply this uh, instrumentation in a flooded field condition like rice production or marshland studies. Um, uh, so I highly recommend, I definitely uh, came across uh, one or two rice uh, studies with the 600 while I was um, uh, selecting which of the few studies I was gonna present today. So um, I would definitely would look out there. There is studies out there, um, but um, I would, I would uh, recommend the same as I was, I was saying to the coastal wetlands uh, person as well as um, uh, the marshland or uh, as the other uh, person I just mentioned that there is um, uh, lots of options for, field, for tube length um, and it really it just comes down to uh, how uh, well you protect the top opening of the tube. Um, the next question is, hi, do you have any experience in studies of the cocoa tree? Um, I personally don't know of any uh, studies right now that have been done on cocoa tree. Um, I think it'd be a really interesting application. Uh, we do have a lot of people that have used, utilized this for trees obviously for tree research. Um, uh, so I think that um, uh, uh, this instrument would, would work just fine for you, but I personally don't know of any um, and don't have any links right or any references off the top of my head of studies that have been conducted uh, in the Kogo, in Kogo tree. 
Um, so the next is uh, a question about um, reliability of the technology. So uh, they installed 30 mini Rosatron tubes in an already established avocado orchard, uh, but uh, the results they were getting were inconsistent and after three years they stopped scanning. Um, for the same treatment and identical fruit tree we obtained 650 root tips in one and about 60 in another. Uh, do you have any advice? Um, I would recommend that you reach out to me uh, via email and we can talk about how uh, uh, we can mitigate that. Um, sounds like there's there could be a multitude of issues happening so um, please go ahead and send me an email directly and we can help figure out what's going on uh, in your particular study um, uh, the next question is for uh, uh, dr. Rossi it looks like so uh, dr. Rossi uh, or Lucas uh, this question is uh, asking um, uh, this type of disease in citrus is, uh, is it in citrus only or is, does it exist in other plants? Um, uh, does it only affect one side or does it affect the whole plant? Well, I think I can answer that. It, it, it does affect the whole plant. So it's not just one side, it's systemic. So it, it, the, the entire plant will, uh, will show symptoms. Um, there are other diseases that are similar to this one, uh, like the Xylella fastidiosa. It's it's a, the, the the Pierce disease is something that you find in um, in uh, grapes in wines, um, or or it's um, it's something that you find in olive trees in southern Italy. Those are the those are similar diseases, but they they, they affect the phloem. This uh, they, 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 sorry, they affect the xylem. This is a phloem limited disease. And right now it's affecting Florida, um, a little bit of Texas, California, Brazil, um, and China. They've been dealing with the disease for a long time in China. And, um, and so we also think that uh, natural selection of plants and um, not really natural selection, it's more like a, uh, better management of the orchard can help. And I saw there are other questions about that, so I will leave that here for now, and I will wait for the other questions, so I will answer yeah. that. Yeah, actually, so the next question is, uh, do you know if anyone's studying what the flies uh, like about the leaf? And then uh, if so, uh, if they know what they uh, don't like, they can, in they can then uh, use genetic modification to insert a gene to produce a sort of repellent for the uh, for the fly. The, the, these are open uh, two big things. Okay. We try in the last 15 years, we try everything to kill that fly. We, they, 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 the growers try everything. I think they knew the entire growth, but they, they, this doesn't, it, it, it didn't work and it will not work. It's a fly. It goes everywhere. So, um, they even try to spray clay on the leaf to make them more appealing to the to the to the fly, and we saw some result. But the end, the fly will will go there and will feed. So no, we don't have um, a cure. We try. We even try antibiotics. We tried systemic insecticide, but they work if the plants are two or three years. So if the if the citrus trees are small. You can control this, this systemic thing. They will go from roots to leaf and the entire plant is protected internally. But when the plants get big, even like antibiotics or something that you can inject, they, it's really hard for them to move to, the, to, to protect the entire plant because the, the, the movement inside the plants are limited and the sun will, uh, will degrade the, 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 the the molecules of the antibiotics. So that's one of the things. Uh, term of genes, GMO, it's an interesting uh, word, but having an uh, orange tree that GMO will pretty much cut all the market to Europe 
from the US, from Florida. So that's something a lot of people have been thinking about, but we never really go that way. And there, there are studies, I mean, there are people that are working on that. We're trying to have a rootstock GMO, rootstock GMO, GMO sign, but so far we don't have one. Um, other thing that people are doing is to put big nets, like screen, they're called cups, citrus under protective screen. So it's like big greenhouses all over your, your, your citrus grove. And um, we have one here. Those, are, th those work, but there are a lot of maintenance. And you know, it's Florida, so we have hurricanes. And having a big like screen net all over your grove, it means that yes, you, you put yourself in a big economic risk every year that you have uh, an hurricane coming into your, your way. Awesome. Um, and actually the next question might be a quick one for you, Dr. Rossi, but is um, how do you know, uh, how to know what the HLB infection looks like by naked eye? Um, it's interesting to see that, is to say that when the psyllid put the, the bacteria inside the plants, sometimes it takes two years before you can even see the symptoms because the bacteria are replicating to the roots. So before you see something, you can, you can, you can wait up to two years. When you, see this, this, when, you, when you have the symptoms, they're pretty clear because the leaf will have a yellow model inside. So when you have that, that yellow spots in the leaves, that's, uh, that's your, your HLB because the nutrients are not going into the leaves, they, they, the starch accumulation into the leaf and you have all these yellow spots. Awesome, thank you. All right, uh, the next question is, um, uh, is the drilled hole bigger than the tube? Uh, if yes, how do you fill the remaining space between soil and tube? If no, how do you insert the tube without scratching the surface? Um, so yes, the, the drilled hole uh, is slightly bigger than the tube, which does allow you to insert the tube without uh, you know, scratching the surface too much. Um, and uh, uh, to uh, fill the remaining space, um, you simply need to allow the soil to settle. Um, Dr. Rossi uh, mentioned that his team uh, uses water to help uh, fill in any air gaps um, to help settle the soil around their tubes. Um, I don't know, Lucas, if you have any more detail on how you guys uh, go about um, making sure that uh, you're, you are uh, getting rid of the space between the soil and the tube after you do your installs. Yeah, so uh, we do the things that you just mentioned, but also uh, keep in mind our soils are very sandy, so they they pack pretty well as it is. So once we install the tube, um, we pack it around and then usually pour a good amount of water around that tube just to uh, stop those air pockets. Awesome. Thank you for that. And uh, the next question, uh, moving on, is uh, what uh, orientation do you keep? Uh, I meant the direction of tube face. So um, I'm, I, I'm not 100% sure what you mean by this question, but uh, uh, one thing that we do recommend is that uh, you mark a position on your tube when you install it. Uh, that way you know uh, exactly in, uh, where you need to insert your scan head to be at the same home starting position every time. Uh, so you wanna make sure if you wanted to be able to uh, easily look at um, uh, 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 changes over time, and you want to see the same image over over a period of time. You want to make sure that you always insert your tube, uh, your insert your scan head at the same exact position uh, on the tube. So you can choose whatever position that is. Um, just make sure you're consistent throughout the the duration of your study. Um, the next question is how to deal with uh, if moisture gets inside the tube. Um, we have a number of mitigation strategies for that. Um, the 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 best way to deal with it if it's already in there. Um, obviously the best way to, to, to deal with it is to, to do it all, your best to make sure it doesn't get in there. But if it does, um, you can use things like, uh, uh, like a soft uh, microfiber cloth or something like that, something non-abrasive to help soak up uh, uh, any of that residual water that might be in there. Um, and we do have uh, um, um, some strategies and uh, uh, for that on our website. If you go to the um, uh, CI uh, 600 or the 602 pages, and then you go to uh, support, 
there is a frequently asked questions uh, page uh, where you can get a lot of answers to a lot of the, the questions like that. Um, the next question is most important rootstocks studied. Uh, I don't think I can, I don't know if I have an answer for that, to be honest. Uh, I don't think any of them are more important than the last one, if that's the question, but um, the question might be, is it more important to study uh, uh, one rootstock than the other? I'm not sure. Uh, uh, sorry, Daniel, go ahead and send me an email directly uh, to, to so I can get more clarification on what, what your question is. Um, thanks. Um, if, you rec if, if it's related to C, I don't know if it was related to citrus because I talk about rootstock. So oh, did you? Was, okay. If it was related to C, you can send me an email, mm -hmm. but we don't have any HLB resistant to, um, uh, rootstocks at the moment. We have some varieties, some science that are showing good results, but in terms of rootstocks, we don't have any HLB resistant rootstocks. Um, and actually, Dr. Rossi, the next looks like two questions are for you. The first one is, do you have any thoughts on evaluating root growth for citrus when grown in combination with cover crops? And how might you differentiate roots from different species? That's a really, really good question. Um, well, let me, let me say something too. Um, uh, there are a lot of studies now on cover crops here in Florida. Dr. Strauss from the South Florida Research and Education Center put in a lot of work on that. And we saw that um, having cover crops, adding compost, uh, adding other organic matters, it really helped restoring fertility in soil, especially in Florida soil that are really sandy and that have been on citrus for like 40, 50 years. So uh, having cover crops is really helping and it's sustainable, it's natural, it's something that I really like as the first thing. Um, how do you uh, like pick the roots that are from the cover crops and the roots that are from the citrus? That, that's that's kind of easy. The, 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 the roots are usually different. So when you're going with your root snap or when you wind rise or you trace the roots, it's easy to, to trace, to, to see that there are, there are roots from cover crops and there are roots from citrus and you will need to define them. And also sometimes they are different deep too. Usually the cover crops, um, they, are, they are in the first um, like part of the soil, the first profile, and then your, your roots are deeper than that. And also most of the cover crops, especially specifically if you have the legumes, or, or if they have different, they have different families, they have a top root, they have nodules, so you can, you can, you can see that they're different. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, I think this next question uh, that uh, also might apply to, to your study as well, uh, can the mycorrhizome uh, commensals be modified to inhibit the invasive bacterium, sort of like competition? We tried, um, not me personally, uh, but the, the, there are studies from the, the University of Florida working on um, uh, mycorrhizome. It didn't really work well for, for HLB. But other studies on the microbiome, so specific microbes, um, that's something that can work. And um, there, there are some potential studies um, that are uh, um, un, un, undergoing right now. So they're, they're, they're ongoing. Um, it's um, one with microbes and the specific microbes that can help uh, root health and can help uh, take up nutrients. So if you can increase these microbes, uh, you, you may help your roots too and, uh, and your, your, your HLB affected trees. So there, there are studies in that direction. Um, I don't know if they have been published yet. Uh, I know people that are working on that specific components. All right, thank you, Dr. Rossi. 
the next question is uh, how much do you charge for one CI 600? Uh, for uh, sales related questions, please guys, if you have a question about pricing or anything, uh, go ahead and uh, request a quote. Uh, it's not gonna, there's no commitment involved, but that'll uh, um, it'll give you a price for the CI 600. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, the next uh, question is, does this technology uh, allow to take images using fluorescence detection? Uh, not at the moment. We don't. Uh, there is. This is not a fluorescence uh, uh, device. Um, uh, uh, but uh, uh, we are looking at, you know, improvements to the, to the technology in the future. So that might be something that we consider in the future. Uh, are there, oh, to me, uh, to, are there any plans for adapting the software to other platforms like iPad OS, given its recent advances? Um, that is a great question. I will actually uh, uh, talk to our uh, engineer who's uh, going to be working on uh, improving our RootSnap uh, software and, and ask him to make sure that that's something that is possible um, for the people that would like to utilize an iPad. So thanks for that. That's a, a great question. Um, the next question is the mini Rhizotron is a machine and how to get and install it. So um, uh, I recommend uh, that you reach out uh, uh, to uh, me personally or uh, reach out to um, our uh, support staff to get some more information on that. Uh, so the next question is older Bart's mini Rhizotron have notches to make sure you are taking pictures at certain depths. Um, so does this system have notches to make sure that your images aren't overlapping? Uh, and so uh, actually this is a great, uh, I, I do have some information for that, but I'm sure Lucas can also expand on that. But um, uh, essentially uh, how it works is we have uh, a handle for the, the actual scan head um, and the handle had, comes with multiple um, uh, uh, adapters or connectors that are exactly the width of the scan, or sorry, exactly the length of the scan window. So every time you put uh, a new whole section of the handle down, you are actually taking an image at exactly the right length. Uh, um, and so you won't have too many overlapping images. But uh, Lucas, if you wanna expand on how you guys um, actually uh, uh, make sure that your guys' images don't overlap too much, uh, you can go ahead and... No, uh, you you, uh, discussed it very accurately. That's exactly what we do. Um, like uh, Mr. George said, the metal, they're like these metal connectors. And if you're doing, for example, the deepest uh, portion of the tube, you would use more connectors and they're all the same length. So that's a way you can keep track of it. Um, there is sometimes overlap. Um, so you have to be careful, but it's a, I think the best way possible is to use those uh, metal connectors. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, the next question is what is different between the six, CI600 and the CI602? Um, and that is that the 602 has a narrower gauge. So its uh, diameter is 1.8 inches. Uh, the 600 has a diameter of two and a half inches. Uh, the 602 is also capable of taking 1200 DPI scans. Um, uh, the next question, um, uh, it is known from experiences developed in mini Rhizotron in pastures. Um, we have had people utilize this in grasslands and tundras, like I mentioned. Um, so uh, I'm sure that it would work uh, just as well for a pasture application. Uh, the next question is uh, for Dr. Rossi. Uh, can we deploy these tubes into pots uh, filled with soil for pot experiment under controlled conditions to avoid environmental factors. I guess, Dr. Ross, if you want to address that, I can also probably uh, help address that. If you, uh, you, you go and then if I, if I want to add something, I will, but I'm pretty yeah. sure you can answer it. Yeah. We have, uh, we have actually a lot of people that utilize these in controlled environments, uh, in greenhouse environments, where um, a lot of the times they actually uh, uh, develop some sort of planting box or, or a, a, a planter of some sort that actually is custom made to be able to fit tubes exactly where they want them. So as I mentioned earlier, there's an experiment where um, they actually created a planting box with um, uh, where they were able to put 25 or so different uh, tubes horizontally. So that, that way they got a almost complete image of, of every possible route 
with that that was established within this uh, planting box. So um, yes, it is entirely possible to deploy those tubes into pots. Um, um, uh, but uh, also, I, I would take that time to, uh, before you just use any old uh, uh, kind of uh, pot, I would go ahead and, and take some time to kind of really think about what way you can maximize uh, 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 the use of, of, and of these uh, 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 scanners just by doing a little bit of customization and, and installing the, the tubes exactly where you want them, uh, where they'll give you the most possible data. Um, okay, this next question, uh, 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 Lucas, I think this one's actually mostly for you. Um, how did Dr. Rossi use water to get rid of air bubbles? Uh, more explanation of this problem and process, please. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so when you install these tubes, sometimes um, if you were to install a tube and then take a scan right away, you may see just pockets of air, so pockets where that soil hasn't um, kind of compacted down. Um, so what we'll, if we see that, um, we'll take a large amount of water, a few gallons, um, and pour it around the tube. Um, and that movement of the water down to the soil actually helps those cavities collapse a bit. Um, so instead of having these bubbles on your scan, you'll just see the soil profile. Awesome, thank you. Uh, the next question is, how did the software split the results of the root uh, diameter volume length into different depth results? Um, I'm not 100% certain if I'm understanding your question correctly. Why don't you go ahead and please email me directly and uh, we can figure out um, uh, what it is that you are uh, uh, specifically asking about. Thank you. Um, uh, oh, this is a question about the CI-710, I believe, uh, the spectrometer. Can it do an entire tree or plant to be able to monitor chlorophyll loss as an early indicator of, of oh, for example, citrus screening, the HLB? Um, so the leaf spectrometer, uh, uh, I mean, it, so it has a leaf clamp. It is used to monitor, uh, you know, individual leaves. You can't clamp an entire tree, I guess, if that's if that was what you're asking um, uh, on in, inside of that spectrometer. But um, yes, certainly you can monitor chlorophyll uh, levels uh, in the leaves. Um, and I don't know if that would actually be an early indicator. I think the earliest indicator as, uh, and Dr. Rossi can explain more on this, but the earliest indicators would be in the roots, uh, I believe. Um, but Dr. Rossi, do you have um, more to, uh, to share on that? We do. Uh, we do take a chlorophylls analysis. So, okay, we do we do take analysis of leaves. We 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 do uh, we check the bacteria titer in leaves, and we have a licor for photosynthesis and stomatal conductance, and we do take measurement of starches. But it's important to say that um, HLB disease affect the whole plant. Now, it affects the roots in a way, so you have slow growth, lots of roots are dead, and because the bacteria is, is replicating there. But of course, the roots are not, are not uptaking nutrients. So what you see is that the plants, are, the whole plant is suffering. So the, the leaves are, are, are turning to be into yellow, and they're starting producing a lot of starches because they say, oh, okay, we don't have sugars anymore. We need to move instead of like already available sugar we are, we are synthesizing starches now because they sense that there is a problem. Uh, less nutrients in the leaf and um, of course less chlorophylls and the, the, the yield of your plants is indirect. So you have, you, have, you have less fruits per plant and the quality is not good at all. So it, the Asian bee affect your old trees. It's not just a root thing. So I uh, would, and I, I guess I'm what I'm what the question was getting at is is monitoring chlorophyll loss wouldn't necessarily be an early indicator of the disease, right? It's just it would already it's a symptom, so it wouldn't uh, it would be you know later on in the stage of, of of infection, right? Yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, the next question also for you, Dr. Rossi, is how is HLB distributed worldwide? It changed a lot in the last 15 years. So we know that um, 
it, it's highly distributed in Asia and uh, particularly um, they're having problems right now in Pakistan, in China, and um, it arrived here uh, from Asia and uh, now Florida, Texas, California. I know Brazil is, is affected. I know for sure Europe is still not affected. So I know that there are a lot of production of uh, citrus in Sicily, Italy, and, um, and they're not affected. Hopefully it will stay that way, but it's it's not a, only a problem in Florida. If that can be an answer, it's a worldwide problem. Thank you. Uh, the next question is: uh, Are there any trials on pulse crops using mini rhizotrons? Um, not that I can think of off the top of my head. I would do a. Uh, we do have. Uh, a feature on our website where you can search applications. So under the applications tab uh, on cid-inc.com, you can actually filter uh, results by uh, the type of instrument. So you just filter it by the CI 600 or the 602, and you can actually look to see um, if there's any studies there. Um, also, uh, uh, I would recommend checking out uh, Google Scholar, but I will I will check myself as well to see if there's any studies out there. Um, nothing, nothing that I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, the next question is uh, about placement of the rhizotron on adult trees, how far uh, from the trunk? Uh, so that's uh, um, uh, a really uh, not an easy question to answer because it really depends on the type of tree, uh, what you expect, uh, uh, how old the tree is. Uh, I mean, if it's an adult tree and uh, uh, and it's a larger species of tree, then, then you will likely want to, uh, uh, you know, um, plant a little bit farther away uh, just because you don't want to injure any roots. Um, but if it's an already established tree, um, you're likely uh, going to uh, uh, disturb the roots in some way. So the biggest uh, thing about uh, installing these tubes uh, on already pre-existing adult plants or, or already established fields or orchards is that you need to allow a good amount of time for everything to settle back down to um, pre-installation levels. So all the stress that you're inducing, all the stress response, uh, all the nutrient levels, they need uh, six to 12 months to return uh, back to normal. Um, uh, so there, uh, 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 I would recommend doing some uh, just preliminary to see where your root structure is at. Um, and then make decision based off that. I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't just assume there's always going to be a consistent distance, and then just drill and uh, hope for the best. I would do a little bit of excavation work uh, beforehand just to be sure. Um, uh, so the next question is also for Dr. Rossi. So Dr. Rossi, do you see a difference in the distribution of roots classified by diameter, branch order, or any other scheme? under different abiotic conditions and infection slash healthy? Uh, and if there are differences, uh, what do the differences uh, in distribution or do the differences in distribution persist over time? Okay, so, so far, uh, because it's, it's, a, it's a fluid situation, we are still in our first year of study. And also the other thing you need to consider is that there are, there are like 200 citrus rootstocks over there there are different type of soil. So it, I don't want to say something that is only related to one rooster in a specific location of Florida, because you have citrus in uh, here in Fort Pierce, you have citrus in Gainesville, you have citrus in Immokalee, and this situation is different. What we saw here is that um, what happened is that there are a lot of dieback in root. So a lot of roots uh, die faster compared to other to an healthy trees and there is a a lot of regrowth so the the, the, the lifespan of your roots is is, is shorter and um, there are a lot of new growth then they will die and then they will grow again and uh, you don't really have a lot of old roots and um, so that can that, that i think we think that this is a sort of um, mechanism of the plants in trying to have new roots that are not highly infected so they can uptake more nutrients from, from the soil. Because of course, if you have an old roots with all the vessel like occupied by the bacteria, 
it's harder for them to uptake the the nutrients that's what where we are right now and again we are working on the publication hopefully we'll be out by the end of the year but the, we're still on working on that awesome thank you dr rossi I uh, just want to remind everyone, uh, if you have questions about pricing, please use the uh, the link that's in the chat to request a quote um, to, to be able to see uh, what the pricing is on the instruments. Um, also, we are going to go ahead and end this webinar at 10 a.m. So if we don't get around to answering your questions, I'm going to try to finish answering them all. But if we don't get to answering your question, please feel free to email me directly and we can answer your question for you. Um, the next question is, uh, I collected imagery in the field that has a considerable amount of haze due to moisture inside the tube. Does anyone have any possible sol solutions to remove this haze? I know that satellite imagery can remove clouds. Um, if you're looking for a way to remove that haze after the image has been already been taken, if they already have that haze, um, I personally don't know of uh, any um, um, solutions. Uh, I'm sure that there is. there are people out there that are um, wizards with uh, some sort of, you know, Photoshop or something like that, but that could be considered adult, uh, you know, some sort of adulteration of your images, I suppose, if you're trying to use them for a publication or something. Um, the best way to, to prevent this is uh, to utilize the large cloth that comes with the instrument and uh, attach it to the end of the, of the wand um, that is used for inserting the actual in the scan head and attach the cloth to that and then utilize that to clean out any moisture prior to taking your scans. The next question is, what is the length of the tube? So the tubes come uh, at uh, 105 centimeters um, standard, uh, but if you require longer tubes, we can accommodate that. Um, if you require shorter tubes than 105 centimeters, you can always cut them to length yourself. Um, uh, but uh, uh, in general, I think that the 105 centimeters is, is a pretty uh, good middle ground for most, uh, most studies. Uh, do we have a tube brush slash internal, uh, internal dryer gadget? So yeah, that um, what I just mentioned with the cloth, uh, the large cloth that comes with the instrument, um, use that uh, uh, to uh, um, attach to the, uh, the, the, the wand that is utilized for the scan head and then use that to clean out the, the inside of the tube. Um, what is the longest length of the tube? Can it be used to observe the root system of submarine plants? Um, so uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I don't actually know the longest possible length that we can send. Um, uh, I'm sure there is some sort of limit uh, on the length uh, but um, if you uh, have questions and a little bit more specifics about your specific project, you can always email me and I will uh, be sure to um, uh, look into that for you. Um, the next question is how to get the static numbers about the roots. Uh, so utilizing the root snap software, uh, you're going to need to trace the roots. Um, and then uh, uh, there is an option um, in the, uh, uh, the menu to be able to get your panel for all of your numbers, um, uh, all the static numbers about your roots. So um, for more, uh, more in-depth uh, look and tutorial, uh, we do have uh, resources online. Um, uh, on our uh, product page, there is manuals uh, that are always available even if you don't own an instrument. Um, you can always look into that, uh, into those manuals. Um, uh, so uh, the longest actually, so I just got a, uh, a notification from um, Susie is that uh, in the past, uh, what we recommend is uh, six feet for the longest tube length. Um, uh, just because uh, uh, with that uh, eventually, uh, trying to lower the scanner lower than that um, might prove to be difficult uh, and, uh, and we likely would end up uh, with uh, a situation you don't want to be in with losing the scanner down in the tube or something like that. So, um, uh, The next question is about support uh, for our software. Um, I apologize if there's been any delay in our support team getting back to you. Uh, 
we are working on a, a, um, a tighter schedule now uh, with uh, everyone, you know, trying to work from home and with the, the, uh, the virus going on. So please be patient with us. I apologize that you've had to wait uh, to hear back from support, but I will look into that for you. Um, uh, you can go ahead and email me directly and then I will, uh, I will loop in support to see what we can do to help. Um, the next question is, uh, can we tie our software into an automatic image analyzer software to automate the root tracing? Um, there are some super cool image analyzer softwares out there, opportunities for partnership. Uh, yeah, that's something that we will absolutely be looking into as we uh, go ahead this year and, and work on our improvements to RootSnap is looking for possible ways to do this, uh, automate the, uh, the root tracing so that people don't have to do that anymore. Um, uh, is it possible to assess root order and retrospectively to change the order of the root if it changes in the time series? Um, that is a great question. I actually would need to go in and, and, and look myself in the RootSnap software. Um, I don't know if Lucas, if you have any experience with that directly. Uh, with changing root orders r retrospectively uh, in a time series, but um, uh, I, I don't know that answer actually off the top of my head. I'd have to look uh, uh, into the software and open up the software and, and do some digging. But um, uh, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I do not have experience with, with changing the orders over time, um, but I will be pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's great. Um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll know your answer soon. Uh, and, uh, and go ahead and send me an email so I can remember to, to get back to you on that. Uh, the next question is, is root growth disturbance an issue when you install the tubes several weeks or months after sowing? Um, if so, would it be a good idea to install the tubes immediately after seed sowing? Yes, I always highly recommend installing the tubes immediately uh, or, or, or coinciding with uh, your seed sowing. Um, that way you actually don't even have to uh, worry about any sort of uh, waiting period to actually allow things to go back to normal because if you do install a tube um, uh, into an already, a, a plant that already has a root structure uh, in place, you are gonna disturb it, it is gonna take up six to 12 months for it to go back to a normal state. Uh, and so that's six to 12 months of, of you having to wait to take scans. If you install a tube uh, co uh, co coinciding with uh, your uh, seed sowing, you will be able to take scans immediately and watch the roots grow uh, from, from uh, uh, nothing. So it'll be, uh, it would be, a, I think, a lot more beneficial uh, to you to, be, to actually install the tubes um, uh, immediately after so seed sowing. Um, the next question is how to get the static numbers about the roots. Again, uh, that's a repeat of a question before, but uh, I would uh, check out the, um, the manual for RootSnap and uh, 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 that's available on our website for free under the product page. Uh, the next question is, we have seven questions left. So hi, I have a couple of questions. One, is it possible to get an idea of a whole root system architecture with a single root imager? Two, do you have any reference which used root imager to study the mycorrhizal root tips and fungal infections? Um, so uh, the first question is, uh, yes, it is possible to get an idea of a whole root system with a single root imager. Um, the, it's not the imager that is the limiting factor here, it's the number of tubes that you install. So you can have, as long as you have enough tubes to, uh, to uh, adequately image and get an idea of an entire root, arc, root system architecture, then you absolutely can get that, those images with a single root imager. But uh, again, the limiting factor here is, can you and is it possible to install enough tubes? Uh, if it's out in the field, it's gonna be pretty difficult um, but if you're doing it in a controlled environment, like I, I, I've mentioned before, then uh, you can develop your own custom uh, uh, planting boxes where you could actually, um, uh, you know, beforehand install tubes in a way that, that would allow you to get an entire uh, um, uh, system, root system uh, image. 
Uh, oh, the question about the references for mycorrhizal root tips and fungal infections. Um, there are studies out there. I don't have um, any on the top of my head or any links I can send you immediately, uh, but you can always search on our website and also uh, on Google Scholar and, and you, will, you will find studies out there for those. Um, uh, are there any studies on taproot elongation rate uh, using this scanning system? Uh, uh, I'm certain there are. Uh, I think that would be a pretty uh, a, a common study that has been done using this uh, technology. Uh, um, I don't know of any off the top of my head. Again, I would look. I would look into our website or look on Google Scholar. Um, those would be the, your best options. Uh, the next question is: What about a new RNA interference technique? I think this might be in, in reference to uh, your study, Dr. Rossi, but I'm not 100% sure if it is if it was a response to a, an answer that you provided earlier or not. Um, I don't, I, I don't have an answer for that. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so the next question is uh, HLB for HLB again. Uh, is anyone, does anyone have a parallel strategy to malaria transmission releasing sterile male flies? Oh, so to mitigate uh, uh, to mitigate the the flies to, to try to get rid of the flies by okay releasing sterile male flies. Do you know of anyone looking into that, Doctor Rossi? Uh, there are there there are several entomologists that that they, they I think they tried that it reduced a little bit, but I'm not hundred percent sure. I know I know they try other stuff too. They try ultrasounds. They were mm -hmm. trying to to blast these ultrasounds into the grove. Um, they try like electric fences or something like that, like an, an um, electromagnetic field around the group. But then you have the day, then the hurricane arrived and you lost power and all the flies go inside. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting situation, the one, the one we have here. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, the next question, we have three left here, uh, is I find it is too difficult to get the root data from the images by the software when the plant is small. So do you have any suggestions? Um, yeah, so depending on how small the plant is, uh, uh, for things like um, some brassica species, if people are looking at very, very small scale plant studies, uh, this roots, the root scanners aren't going to be uh, uh, of much benefit. It's just easiest to, to, do, to do your root measurements the destructive way. Um, but uh, uh, if you uh, are really set on getting some of those really small roots uh, image, then uh, what I would recommend is, um, uh, especially if you're in a controlled environment, uh, doing a, a horizontal install of the tube uh, through a planter box and uh, using the highest possible resolution for your scan images so you can get every small amount of detail you can. Um, and hopefully those root systems will grow around the tube and then you'll be able to get um, uh, a higher resolution, with the higher resolution, you'll be able to get uh, better images of those roots. Uh, the next question is for Lucas. Uh, can you suggest some methods you use in order to protect your tubes from water infiltration in the field? And has that ever happened to you and how do you rectify it? Yeah, so the number one thing we use is covers. Um, so the, when you order these tubes, they come with a lid themselves. Uh, we also add in a PVC cap, um, a tube, and then we put a waterproof cap on top of that. Um, so that's the number one way to prevent water infiltration. Another one um, would be to, depending on what kind of crop you're working on. So we're working on citrus trees. Um, so there's a irrigation system beneath the tree and it's like a micro jet or a, a micro drip. Um, so you don't want to place your tube directly next to your irrigation system. Um, yes, I have had tubes fill with water. Um, right now we have a system uh, with a shop vac and a generator that we can take into the field. Um, so if there's a, a, a lot of water in that tube, we can suck it out. Um, and then we also have um, microfiber cloths that we can use to clean the inside of the tubes if they get bad enough. Awesome. Thank you for that insight. Um, and then the next question is, uh, you might also be able to shed some light on this, but I can also address it is when the soil becomes soft after irrigation or rain in the field, how much does the tube move from its position and affect the images on roots on correlation of the previous images to measure growth? Um, the number one thing I have to say about this is that 
um, that is completely dependent on the composition of your soil. Um, and Lucas, I don't know if you have experience. I'm sure that with the sandy soil, you probably have experience with your tubes shifting a little bit on you. The uh, only time I've noticed a shift in the images was when we saw air pockets around the tubes at first. Um, I've been scanning for almost a year now and I haven't had much shifting um, other than when there's air pockets. Um, and then when those collapse, of course you get some shifting, but as of yet, I have not seen any major shifts just due to the, the, the uh, soil. So Awesome. Yeah, there, there, is, uh, there is a chance for some shifting uh, to occur. The best way mitigation strategy for that is, as Lucas said, to ensure that uh, your soil has settled as best as possible by forcing out any air pockets um, that are present after you install the tube um, and do a really good job of, of, of installing it uh, uh, and ensuring that soil is completely surrounding the tube. Um, in some cases, like in uh, with really you know clay-based soil or or really dry arid environments, um, uh, you know it might be more difficult uh, to keep the tube from shifting. Um, so I, I know that there are people that uh, uh, implement some measures like um, you know uh, securing it to stakes in the ground or things like that to ensure that it doesn't uh, shift um, uh, too much due to any sort of environmental factors. Um, the last question here. Uh, so are you going to send to our emails the recorded webinar or where is it going to be available? So yes, if you register for the webinar, it will be emailed out to you. Uh, we also uh, will be putting it up uh, uh, on the internet. Uh, usually we utilize YouTube uh, and um, but we might use another uh, other platforms as well to, to put it up on the internet, but it will be available. Uh, both at your email and then on the internet uh, at a later date. And so check our website if it doesn't come to your email. Uh, get in touch with us or check our website for uh, updates and you'll likely see a link to it soon on our website. Um, so yeah, well, thank you so much for joining us, everybody that's attending who are still on the chat here, listening to all the questions. Um, appreciate all the questions, all the interaction. Uh, Dr. Rossi, thank you so much. Your presentation was awesome. Thanks for helping answer the questions. Lucas, thank you as well. Uh, really appreciate you guys being here. And uh, I hope everyone stays safe and stays healthy. And uh, um, please feel free to reach out to any of us if you have more questions. Um, we're more than happy to answer. So thank you, everyone.